At the beginning of the year, we like to refresh our vision and values. At this time, let me ask um, our brother William or whoever's running AV to uh, project just a page from our website so you can see our values. I hope you, if you're a member of our church, you know this. And I, we're not going to we're, we're only gonna spend four weeks on this series, and so we can't do all the values. Um, but these are the these are our important values of our church. And the first two messages were all from that first value, gospel, that we are gospel-centered and grace-driven. Grace and uh, the first message was on the gospel this, of the year, and last week it was all about grace, the power of grace. Look at the, the, the one on the bottom left, it's family, that we are a counter-cultural, cross-generational, cross-intergenerational family, all right? So that's what I'd like to preach on today. We'll go ahead and let that go. Today's message is called The Family of God, and um, if you've been pastored by me for a while, you may have heard me talk about this, this particular passage. It's a passage that I don't think it gets preached very much, and um, I have meditated on this a lot because, because of this particular value, that of the church as a family. Now, I, I think all around the world, you know, people that are very family-oriented. Most cultures around the world are deeply family-oriented. And when they read these passages and see these passages that really talk about the church as like an intergenerational family, it really resonates with them. But there's something about America right now in this chapter, in this season. We in American culture, we're almost, we're almost anti-family. We're all just about me. It's super individualistic. And... Um, you know, I wasn't planning to be like controversial, but let me just, just point out one thing that just shows you how anti-family America is right now. We have this thing called the transgender movement. And young girls, it's more girls than boys, which is kind of surprising to me, but I'm not exactly sure why. But young girls than boys, you know, think it's their right to change themselves into a boy. And I want you to just think a little bit about that. What does that mean if you just think a little bit about this, if you're going to be a guy that turns yourself into a girl biologically, physically, you're basically neutering yourself. You're, not, you're basically cutting off the possibility of having children. And vice versa for, the, for, for women today too. That is tremendously anti-family. It's tremendously anti-family. And that's, that's, that's just a thing. It's a very common, big, big thing going on in America today. And... That would have been really shocking to all of history, and it still is really, really shocking to the world, and it's very, very difficult in America right now. But that's just one, just one thing, and I'm not trying to be controversial, but just one incredibly like, obvious facet feature of American culture right now, it's anti-family, right? And so I want to just show you something, how tremendously important this value of how the church is seen in the Bible as family, okay? So part one, the everlasting family. That's what the church is. The everlasting family, part one. Part two, commit yourself to gospel-centered family life. Okay, I hope that sounds kind of familiar in our church. Commit yourself to gospel-centered family life. That's the big application I want to urge for you today and throughout 2022, which is desperately needed in our society. And you need it too. I need it. Part three, the life shining in the darkness. The life shining in the darkness. If you are living in life without family, you're living in a lot of darkness. That's why so much of America feels dark. It's people that feel like they have no belonging. And for that, there's tremendous darkness. But there is a life shining into the darkness through the family of God, okay? Um, let's go into this passage. I want to show you um, a couple things about it. So it just seems like one of these things, Paul just starts off the letter, who he says he is, and it just seems to have like your typical kind of greeting stuff. But it just has some really interesting and important features. And these first two letters, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, are letters from kind of like a senior seasoned pastor, Paul, writing to a younger man who's going to be a leader, a shepherd in the church. And his name is um, Timothy. So Paul to Timothy is a really important movement 
in, in the history of the church and the history of the world, actually. But let's just go to verse, uh, let's, verse 4 of chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. So they, they have a close relationship. I don't know if it's tears, like he cries with tears because he loves Paul so much, or because Paul is writing this from prison and he's suffering right now, right? And so maybe it's tears because of sadness for Paul, right? Verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So let, let me just say something a little. Um, there is a, a sociologist. Well, she's a sociologist. She's a culture critic of some sort. I've been reading her, and her name is Mary Aberstadt. And she kind of has a twofold thesis. One of the reasons why America is breaking apart is because people don't go to church. And because people don't go to church, the family is breaking apart because a lot of people don't understand that the church strengthens the family. And as in, in like capitalistic society where everybody goes off to try to make money on their own, it's like how will you pull the family together with deep love and values and virtue and humility and forgiveness and those things. Now, she's not the only person to say that. A lot of people have said that. But she also makes another very interesting point, which is maybe the church is not doing well because, because the family is not doing well. Say, so church, you need the family to do well. But she's also pointing it the other way. Maybe it goes the other way. That because the family's not doing well, people aren't coming to church together because everybody's running off trying to like, be their own savior. I think that's a, there's a lot of truth to that. But look at verse 5. How did you get this? Timothy is one of the most incredible and important leaders in history, even though he's not famous in the secular world. He's famous in the spiritual world. He's famous in the history of God's church, and rightfully so, because no Timothy, the church doesn't advance to the next generation, and then the Timothy finds the next Timothy. How does a Timothy come about? And it comes, and it starts not with him, it starts with his grandmother. Hmm. See it? It starts with Lois, and then he's a little kid growing up on the knee of Lois, and then it goes to his mother Eunice, and by the way, his father was not a Christian. And there's, there's a, I won't go into all the details of this, but Timothy is not fully Jewish. There's, you know, he comes, his mother is Jewish, Jewish on the mother's side. A Jew believes in Jesus as the Messiah. But on his father's side, his father's Greek, you know, and Greek not by ethnicity, but by Hellenistic. And he did not believe in Jesus. And yet the faith, the gospel, and the power of God is alive, flowing through grandmother to mother to him. And what you get is an incredible leader, kind of a, 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 a young, a boy that becomes an incredible man and it started before he was ever born. Now, just here, here's an important verse. It says, um, it, in, later in the book, it talks about that since he was really young, he knew the scriptures. <laughs> Since he was really young, he knew the scriptures. And when I read that, you know what, that, what I just say? That means he came to church. <laughs> okay? It's not, that, it's not that complicated. He learned the Bible ever since he was little. And the Bible is being sewn into him. And his whole view of the world, how, who is God? What is eternity? What is sin? Is there forgiveness? Is there love for me? What is right? What is wrong? What is worthy? What is bad? And all these things are not just being put as ideas in his head. They're, they're being placed as deep, deep structures of his heart. And the more you get that since you're little, it starts to shape a person so that the, the, the children are just, are, there's, there's, like, there's something that's being powerfully placed in them. Even if they can't, like you talk to them, they can't like bring all the, they can't draw the dots together because that's what little kids are like. So I just want to just start by just making a first and a simple little comment here. And I, I don't, I'm not trying to get on any of you guys, okay? And please, so don't ever that. I'm not judgmental like this. I, I, I've been a dumb dad, and I've made all kinds of... But let, let me just say a little something to all of you who are parents, all right? 
There's so many parents today who think they're going to be at home and they got to do everything right for their kids. If they do everything right, their kids will, like, get a 1600 in the SAT. <laughs> their kids will, uh, you know, be, make the, they'll be stars on their sports team. They will, you know, win, you know, like, you know, jujitsu tournaments. And then they're going to go off to the top schools and they're going to have a great life. You're trying to give everything to your kids. And all these parents who are trying to give everything to their kids. You know what I always regularly see gets cut short? Church. It's like the thing that in life where, like, if something needs to kind of give for the kids, it's church. And you know what I think? I think it's unbelievably backwards. It's unbelievably backwards. The most important person in your life to the life of your child is not you, dad. It's not you, mom. It's Jesus. And, you know, children, the children, it's simple for them. Where are you going to go meet Jesus? At church. It's simple. Right? And so if you bring your children into the house of God and you set that time of church into the house of God where the gospel is proclaimed and the Bible is inculcated into their heart, into their mind, and all kinds of stuff, through the teaching, through the songs, through the holidays, through all the different ways that we bring the word of God into their heart, just like Timothy had from his grandmother and his mother, then what you're doing is you're giving your children the greatest gift. You know, like, I don't know if you, you, you can sometimes hear this, that like I have a bit of a touch and go relationship with my dad. We, we really had problems at times, okay? So I'm, I'm not particularly a rebellious son, but I did rebel against my dad, right? I will say this about my dad. The one thing that he did that I'll always be grateful for, he practically never missed church. <laughs> like, never. He didn't miss church on Sunday. If we had midweek Bible study, he never missed. And whatever it took to get us, and, you know, like, if our Bible study is on the other side of town in the middle of the week, he'd get home early from work, <laughs> he'd make us eat a fast dinner and get our butts in the car, and we're there. And my brother and I are like, it's all in Korean, so we're like bored. <laughs> we're so bored. We're like, who are these people? And everything's in Korean, and I can't understand this Bible stuff that they're learning. But you know what, you know what I got out of it? Church, God, Jesus is right up there at the top of the list of what's important. That's what I take, came away with it. So when I got to college, and like, of course, I'm in a secular school. Nobody's going to church. They're all partying. They're like sleeping off their hangovers. And they're just going to study for their midterm after they wake up at noon on a Sunday morning. They deal with their head. And when their head like clears up from their hangover on Saturday night, they start studying for their midterm on Sunday afternoon or something like this. I would like drag my butt out of bed at 9 a.m. And I would listen to the message or sometimes fall asleep on the message. And I don't even remember a lot of the messages on Sunday morning in college. But my dad led me to the house of God. See? And I never forgot that. Huh? So let me go on. Inside your biological family, the movement. So if you believe in Jesus, even if just one of you believe in Jesus, and you get married and you have children, let me tell you something. Something important has happened in your family. And grace is going to move into your family from generation to generation. Sometimes it's, it's strange. Somebody gets saved. They have kids. They have two kids. One kid loves Jesus. One kid hates Jesus, right? One kid hates Jesus and just wants to like get rich or you know, live like, uh, you know, like some super worldly lifestyle. Or sometimes both kids don't even follow Jesus. But then something funny happens. Then one of those kids gets married. Their marriage starts to like tank. And then they start going back to church. And one of the grandchildren, you can't keep them from away from Jesus if you tried. It's like that. So we just regularly don't see Jesus. But it's kind of like Jesus is there for you, even though we're not there for him. And Jesus will be there in your child's life, even though you're not doing a great job putting Jesus in your child's life. That's how it is. Now, let me point out something to you that's in this passage. This is incredibly important. It's actually more important. So this is the way the, the book begins. Paul, 
an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, the life that is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 2, to Timothy, and listen what he calls him, my beloved child. To Timothy, my beloved child. Who is Timothy to Paul? He calls him my child. You're like, well, that's really nice. It's more than nice. In the Bible, when Paul thinks about Timothy, he sees himself as a father to a son. A father to a son. And if you think this is just one place, here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 1, the book right before this. Here's how he calls him. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. My true child in the faith, that's what he calls him. Okay, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, that's the way he's going to call him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Timothy. Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. That's what he calls him. Totally different book. He's writing to a different church. He's not writing to Timothy. But when he refers to Timothy, when he's talking about refer referring to Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. All right, one more. Philippians chapter 2, verse 22. And here he's talking about, I'm going to send you, Church of Philippi, the best person I've got. And who's the best person he's got? Timothy. And here's how he puts it. You know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. As a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. When Paul thinks about Timothy, he's thinking about family. That's what he sees. He doesn't think about a friend. He doesn't just think about a fellow pastor, although he is a fellow pastor. He's not just thinking about, I'm your mentor, you're my mentee, I will pour. No, no, no. He's thinking about his family. He's thinking about his son. How do you think Timothy became Paul's son? According to the Bible, how do you think it comes? Because the church is family. That's what it is. Now, I want to just say something about this. This is so important. Um, it's so basic. Church is family, the family of God. If you, if you give your life to Jesus, you get forgiven of your sins, and then you get to call God your father, <laughs> Right? And then he adopts you into his family as the sons and daughters of God. We become brothers and sisters of Jesus, the very first and only begotten son of God. Right? It's super basic according to the gospel. But for some reason, when we think about family, you know what most of us all think about? We think about our nuclear family. Or we think about our nuclear family. And that's not necessarily wrong because everybody knows that when you're born into your family, you owe your family. You, your blood is theirs. Your, their ancestors are yours. They owe you and you owe them. So at the very, very least, if you fail your blood family, your nuclear family, most people think you're a bad person. And that just cuts across every culture. And you know what? That's just basically true, is it not? Because nobody was ever intended to just be born into the world and just get thrown out. If you have a baby and then throw them out in the world and says, good luck, what's going to happen to that baby? That baby will die. And how will that baby become the full, beautiful person that he or she was meant to be? Their family must pour into them. And already, even when you're born, you have been gifted by your family. Not you've been gifted by You've been gifted by their blood and by their genetics and all that other stuff, but all their talents and all their gifts and all their loves are already gifted to you, which is why when somebody is, you know, uh, given up by their family, they really feel lost. But I want to say a little something about this. Every family on earth, okay, whether you are a Smith or you're a Jones or you're a Ramirez, you know, or a Gonzalez, or a Chang, or a Chu, or a Park, or a Lee, whatever family you are a part of, let me say something. Families die out. And families fail all the time. And some of you come from 
a pretty broken, dysfunctional, failing family. You know it. It's a painful thing. You know it very firsthand. Let me tell you something. God's family is everlasting. It's forever. This, This thing that we do called church, it's not the building. It's not the organization. It's your people. The blood of this family, it's most important, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's blood was shed so that he would wash all our very, very sinful, the, in my family, the, the Park family, sinful blood would be washed by the precious holy blood of Jesus. And I would be invited into the everlasting family of God and the everlasting family of God is far more than the Park family. And I've listened to some people who talk about their family and their family has had, has had divorce, abuse, abandonment, hatred, bitterness, betrayal. And when they think about their own family, there's so much pain. But, you know, I often think that, they, that well, we, all these people in our city who are experiencing that, you know what they need? They need a new and better family. And there is one. It's God's family. <laughs> God's family. So, you know, that's why you got to have really good elders who be fathers of God's family. That's why we take this so seriously. And there's so many hurting people. And so some of you, we want men who will look at a young man and say, that's my son. That young girl over there, I'm going to treat her like my daughter from God. She's not my blood relative. She's not even my ethnicity. Different skin color, but she's going to be my daughter. I'm going to treat her like my daughter. And some of you ladies out there, it's not just a man thing. Of course you can be spiritual mothers. So sometimes if you're alienated or you don't even have to be married, you could be single. And you could be single and God will give you daughters. God will give you sons. God will give you nephews and give you nieces to love, and you'll watch them thrive because of you. It's God's church, all right? Let's go to part two. Commit yourself to the gospel-centered family life. Now, how? Let's talk a little bit about how. We have this thing in our church, and every church has, a lot of churches have something like this. We call it small group, community group. In our church, We literally call it GLF, Gospel Life Family. And there's other ways. We have this thing called Life on Life Missional Discipleship where we are doing family life, life on life with each other. And most, you know, it's it's Life on Life Missional stuff. We don't fault any of you for not being in that. Plus, you know, you can't sign up for it. You have to be, you know, like spiritually selected and someone has to think about you. But you can all sign up for GLF. Gospel life family is the way God intended church to be. This thing that we do on Sunday where the big church gets together, it's great, okay? But actually, the real life of the church is in the family life. So Pastor Young and I, we, we, we have this small, we called it family. And we think it's so tremendously important. And especially in this time of COVID, everybody's so used to like, okay, well, okay, I, I, might get, I might get the virus from some of them. Or, oh, wait a second, it's just so much more convenient to do it on a TV screen. But I don't know about you, but I don't like hanging out with my, my kids on, on a TV screen. I like being with my kids, right? I like being with my family. And I'm not trying to like guilt any of you. Like, I know it's a difficult time. It's COVID, you know, it's, but I want to put a vision into your mind of what this could be like. Now, the way I want to do this is, so please think about this. I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you a a series of quick, you know, hopefully I'll be brief about this. I want to share with you about the family at at a church, the church we were in when we were in Philadelphia, when my wife and I were filled, we were part of a really important GLF, gospel. The church didn't call it gospel life family. You know what the church called their small groups when we joined it? It's really interesting what they called it. They called it mini church. That's what it was. They called it mini church. And I want to tell you some stories about our mini church from New Life Presbyterian Church of Glenside, a church that we were a part of for not quite five years at a tremendously important time of our life. 
And just to do that, let me, let me, let me, show, let me show some pictures. All right, let's see if I can project them. All right? All right. These are the men that was in our GLF, right? And um, who's that little kid sitting there? In, uh, the, the first guy's name is Ed Crane. And this little kid sitting there comfortably in his lap is Elizabeth. <laughs> That's Elizabeth. And uh, let's go to the next picture. Here are, the, here are the mothers of the group. Here are our sisters in our family. And this is date night, Valentine's Day, <laughs> 2006, okay? And um, we, all got, we all got babysitters, but uh, we, we were like, uh, we, can't, we can't leave this little baby with. So we, we were the only one that brought our baby. Hudson and Laura was with the babysitters. And if you could see, Grace somehow did not get the, the, the memo about wearing red, okay? <laughs> Um, this was Valentine's Day night, and um, the woman sitting right next to, to Grace, she's half Thai, and, um, and her father is named um, Roger Clark, and her father was one of the elders of our church, and we did a lot of life with these people. You know, I, we didn't have many date nights like this, so that's just, it's kind of really memorable and I wasn't sure how I was going to, like, uh, the Lord kind of gave, you know, sometimes I just love when Jesus just hands the illustration for the sermon in, you know, sometime in the middle of the week. You know, I have this little widget on my iPhone, and these old pictures showed up, and that picture showed up. And I started thinking about GLF and our family, and I thought about family. Let me just tell you a little something about these people. Her father, Roger Clark, was an elder in the church. When we joined this GLF, this mini church, so some of you know about this. We came to this church. We were just coming out of marital counseling, and we told all of these guys, our marriage is on the men's. And we need you to watch our marriage and pray for our marriage, right? And when Elizabeth was born eight weeks premature, who prayed for that? Who prayed for her? They were like shocked and oh my goodness. And then when she, when we brought this tiny little baby, eight week premature baby, you, okay, all these women were so excited. <laughs> were, Woo! Right? And so we just, we'd bring our kids. It's inconvenient. But guess what? The bottom is going to drop out in your life. And you are not big enough to handle it on your own. And your children need to see that they have the family of God. So this is 2006, early 2000. I'm 34 years old, guys. Grace is 31 years old. And we're young. And about a year from now, what's going to happen is we're going to find out that, actually, we, it's not actually a year from now. We already know. It happened during um, Grace's pregnancy with Elizabeth, in this period of our life, Grace's uh, mother was dying of cancer. <laughs> and who prayed for us and walked with us through this very, very, she had stage four cancer. It was a really painful period of our life. And our marriage was not super strong. And Grace would have to like leave Philadelphia and spend two weeks away in New York at a time when our marriage wasn't at its strength, and who walked with us, who loved us, who prayed for us. I remember a poker night with these dudes, <laughs> and I was holding Elizabeth while Grace was gone in New York, seeing her mom in, in the cancer ward. And the whole time in the poker night, Elizabeth cried like straight for like an hour straight. Rah! Just like an hour straight. And all the guys were like, I don't hear anything. You hear anything? You hear anything? And we just kept like poker. Uh, you, okay, you probably all think, what a bad dad. <laughs> Do you think she doesn't look damaged now, do you? Do you see her being damaged? But dad needed his brothers. And she needed her uncles. And it's really inconvenient to bring your baby to poker night, okay? But sometimes you just need your church's family more. So Daisy's father, in 2007, we 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 said goodbye to mom, and she went home to Jesus. And I still remember this. After the funeral, the elders in the church said, hey, the parks lost Grace's mom. Who will mourn with them? 
Who will share the gospel with them? Who will go to their house? And you know who raised his hand? Roger Clark. <laughs> and I'd only talked to Roger like maybe three times. It's a large church. There's like 500 people in the church. So I'd only talked to Roger like just barely a few times. And there was one time when Roger bumped into me when I was studying for hours and hours and hours. I was studying like a madman for my PhD comprehensive. I was basically living in Panera. And Roger and his wife bumped into me at Panera, and they saw me. They came up to me. They embraced me. And Roger and Karen said, we are so thankful that our daughter and our grandchildren are in your small group or in your mini church. And I was like, I didn't even know if you knew me. And I don't know exactly what it was. I think maybe because we were Asian and she was part Asian and she kind of liked that. And uh, maybe because, maybe just because, you know, kind of word had gotten around that, that we, in our, in, our, in our mini church, we took pains to get babysitters. And we didn't get the babysitters just to help out everybody else. Here, let's go to the next picture. Let's go to the next picture. In the, we took pains to get babysitters. And so this is uh, the following year. Go to the next one. So this is Halloween of 2007. And you see those eight people? There was, like, what, there was four men and four women in 2006. By the following year, we had grown. And we, our, our mini church, the church hadn't grown in size. I think it was still roughly the same number of people. But our mini church were, was growing. We were busting at the seams. And, my, and, and I was co-leading with, uh, with, with uh, one of the men in that group. And we were talking about multiplying because we were growing because we had made a plan for the kids. We made a plan for the kids. And we just considered, let's bring the whole family together. And the kids, they actually loved coming. And it was, this was kind of what it was like. We used to meet on a Tuesday night. And then everybody's going like, but my kids need to be in bed by like 8.30. <laughs> so we would show up like at about 7 or And then you guys kind of know what it's like. It's kind of, you don't get going until like 7.15. And then people would like split right there on the spot at 8.30 because their kids need to be in bed. Because we all have little kids. And the, and the ones that had babies, the, you know, like we'd meet at Daisy's house. And, you know, in her room, she would go, you could put your, we have an extra crib, you could put your kid in there. And one or two of them would do that. Our kids wouldn't go to bed that early, so that, we never did that. So that was difficult. So we're like, okay, let's, we tried Tuesday night that way. We tried Thursday night that way. Then we said, you know what, this is hard. Let's go to a Friday night and let's meet every other week. So we came up with this plan. First and third Fridays, we would meet because Friday the next day is not school, so we can hang out later, right? So that's what we did. But we said, we'll do one meet first and third Fridays, and on Sunday, one of the Sundays, like the fourth Sunday, let's just get together for a potluck dinner. So we did that for about three months. And then Daisy went, I don't like it, guys. <laughs> it's just went, I can't remember which is the day we're supposed to meet. I can't remember which is the potluck day. It's, she's like, it's annoying, and plus I just miss you guys. So you know what, it's, 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 it's a hassle for me and, and Ed, Ed is the one holding the baby, and, you know, Elizabeth at the time. It's a hassle for us to, like, clean up our house, but just come over. Let's just do it every week, and let's make it Friday. So that was great because Rich and I, his name is Rich Ransom, and he actually was here on our, our, our launch service day. We're still close friends. And we were thinking, let's go to Friday because then we don't have, we can just stay up, and the kids don't have to go to bed. And, you know, a lot of people tend to think, Friday night, you're supposed to go hang out, and blah, blah, blah. Let me, let me just say something to you. When you're single, Friday night is like, let's go out and hang out. So people don't like, oh, let's do a church thing on a Friday night. That doesn't seem like a, a fun idea. But as soon as you have kids, <laughs> what are you going to do, go partying on Friday night? <laughs> are you going to go out in there and, like, stay out super late and get hammered or something like that on Friday night? Why don't you go be with your family on Friday night? It's great for the kids. So we thought it was going to be a bit, a bit of a tough sell to try to push it on Friday night, but it was great. Daisy said, let's just do it on Friday night. And Rich and I were like, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit, for just convincing her of that. And uh, Daisy could be kind of assertive, and she did that. And it was great. Now let me um, tell you one other story that might help you. We live in Silicon Valley. Many of you are very, very career-driven. 
You were always worried about your career. And it's super expensive here, right? I want to tell you something. So if you want to live and walk with your family, over the years, you know how many prayer requests we saw answered? It's crazy. I think God especially loves to answer his children when they pray together. So that when he answers that prayer request, then they all can see it together. I think that's, and then all their faith gets magnified together, and then they're encouraged to walk and love each other and as a family together. So you know if you have important prayer requests, you should go to GLF and share it. And if you want to see a lot of prayer requests answered, that's a really good way to go. So let me just tell you the story, and then I'll go to the close of my message. It's 2008. Now, I don't know if you remember 2008. Something happened in 2008. It was called the global financial meltdown. The stock market went like, like this, and everybody in the whole world went completely scared and crazy. And whole companies went belly up. Well, right around that time, my buddy Rich, before that, he had tried, he had, he, he had a background in corporate accounting. He had left his job, and he tried his hand at real estate investing because he wanted to, like, stop working for corporate America, and he wanted a little bit more free time so he could build his family, he could invest in, in, in God's kingdom and so forth and make enough money doing that. But it wasn't working out for him. So then he started looking around for a job during 2008. So let me just ask you, from a worldly point of view, is that the year you want to go look for a job? If you have secular wisdom and you're like, hey, let's go look for a job, let me tell you, that is like the last time in the world you want to look for a job. But Rich needed a job. We all pray for that job. And you know what? He got one. He got a job at a really crummy company. <laughs> the company was being investigated by the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, because they were like lying on the books, okay? And they hired my buddy, and he was a corporate accounting, right? But he's a Christian. And so they had an appointment with the SEC, and he basically said, you know, that his boss were pressuring him to basically lie to the government so they don't get in trouble. And you know what Rich said? He was like, no way. I ain't doing that. Because in his mind, I belong to Jesus. No job, no money, no status, no way, there's no way I'm lying over that. But this is the job the Lord had provided him, and if he lost his job in 2008, he'd be in big trouble, right? He would feel like he's in big trouble. Like, but Richard Faith, and we prayed for this job. God gave him this job, okay? Oh, it gets better. They have this product. This was their main cash cow. And we thought it was kind of a lame product, to be honest with you. So I was like, really lame product, really bad leaders, leaders who are like, they probably should go to jail. Uh -oh, okay, let me just quickly finish out. Rich went to the SEC meeting. He convinced them there's no way I'm lying. And what we should do is just come clean and maybe the government will be nice to you. That's exactly what happened. Rich totally came clean. And if you ever met him, you just know he's an utterly no BS guy. You just know, like, this guy does not lie. He's not no BS. So I think they, the government guys saw that in him, and they were lenient to his bosses instead of throwing him in jail, right? So because Rich worked for the company, God saved the company. I'm not kidding. And then it gets crazier. So now there's this product, which we don't think is a good product. The company was like super low on cash. So this was his prayer request in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, our, in our small group to GLF. He said, hey, guys, we're going to shove all our money onto this one marketing day on Home Shopping Network because that's where they sold their product. And basically, if we don't have a good day on Home Shopping Network that day, we're done. The company's going to go under and I'm going to lose my job. So just guys, just do me a favor. I don't love my job. I don't love my company, but I need a job. So would you pray for this, a really good day on Home Shopping Network? And we all were like, okay. And you know what I was thinking? I was thinking, dude, this is a stupid company. <laughs> it's a stupid product. This is not going to happen. Rich, I was like, Rich better start looking for another job. But it's our brother. It's, it's family. And who knows what God will do? So we prayed. 
the numbers came in a week later, and they had a gangbuster day. <laughs> it was crazy. It saved the company. And then the following year, the bosses has left, and then they got new leadership, new leadership, new vision, new products. And my buddy Rich, you know what happened? His career took off. Do you want to see something? You want to know how God works? It's like that. <laughs> when I talk to Rich today, and he's really been really successful in his business. He's a CEO of his own company, blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. I won't go into details like that. And when we talk about that, we laugh our heads off because we remember the night when we prayed <laughs> in the mini church, in GLF, Lord, will you save the company for Rich's sake? <laughs> and the Lord did more than that. He gave him a whole career. You believe me? This is what it's like. And some of you, if you want faith, you want to see these things. It's in the gospel. It's all by grace. You know where the grace flows out? If you want to taste grace, experience grace, see the bigness of God's grace, you got to go and be a part of church, the family of God, and walk with your family. That's where you'll see it. That's where you'll taste it. That's where your kids will taste it. Let's close. There's a verse I've been meditating on in, um, early in the Gospel of John. And the Lord gave this to me during Christmas because this is like, you know, a Christmas text. But it goes like this. John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. In him, this is Jesus. In Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. Let me say that. In Christ is life. And that life is the light of men. Verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And I just thought about that verse and meditated on that verse a lot. Why? I don't know about you. It feels really, really dark to me. I look at our politics, dark. I look at our, gov our government and the things that they're doing, dark. I look at the kids, they look so lost. I feel so, so much pity and compassion on them because our whole society as adults were failing the kids, just failing them. I look at the college students. I look at the preschool kids, just, just failing them. So dark. I hear so many kids are depressed and they're self, they're self, they're self mutilating. It's terrible. Dark. But the darkness has not overcome the life that is in Christ. It never will. And you know what? The problem is there is life in Christ, but people have to see it. It has to be lit. It has to be like light. In darkness, there has to be light. And if it's light, then you can see. And then you can see you won't bump around and fall on your face and get hurt. Because you're walking in light. The life of Christ, that's real life. And that life, all of us, if you're not living in Christ, you're dying and you're wandering around in the dark. But in Christ, there's life everlasting. And you know where that life everlasting, the light of that life shines? It's in his family. <laughs> it's in the church. Jesus Christ came so the people in the darkness of their own sin and of their own wisdom of their own selfishness, and we're all curled in on ourselves, of our deep, deep loneliness. He came so that his life would be life that would conquer all our death and sinning. He would die the death we deserve to die so that his resurrection life could shine. And you know what each church is like? is the candle of the life of Jesus Christ shining in his family. And if you will have faith that that life will be for you, when you feel like, oh, my faith is going weak, my trust in Jesus is going weak, it's probably because you're depending on yourself too much. So then you should go to your family and let them show you his life yet again. That's how it is. If you ever feel weak, go into the church and drink in the gospel 
and let your family. So that not, I'm not even talking about Sunday. I'm talking about a Friday night. Let your family shine the life of the light of the life of God that no darkness can overcome. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, I don't know how we got to this place in America where everybody thinks that they are wise and utterly sufficient and for themselves. We are not sufficient for ourselves and we're certainly not sufficient for our children. And yet you, Lord, you, are, you already have Timothys in our midst and you already plan to love them even before they were born. You plan to bless them to grandchildren cross-generationally. You plan to bless them through mothers that are not their biological mothers. You plan to bless them through fathers that they will meet in church. A man who will look upon a young boy or a man who will say, oh, this kid, he's going to be my son. And I will lay down my life to bless him however I can. And you will raise up Timothys and Eunices and Loises in our church. And we pray, Lord, in this pandemic season, when we have become extra lonely, we have become extra prideful, we have become extra anxious and controlling, I pray that we would relearn this year in 2022 this important value that you have given us tremendous gift through your family, the church. And we would commit ourselves yet again to find our gospel life families and let them love us when we are low and let us rejoice when we see great things of you. And even years later, we would laugh when our brother, his career has taken off from a company that looked really, really crummy and even investigated by the government because your children as family asked you, Lord, asked you. Thank you for doing this in us. Thank you for making your family like this. May revived church be filled with so much heavenly supernatural love with the power, the presence, the wisdom, the grace that flows from Christ in us through our brothers and sisters and through our sons and daughters. We pray that you would turn us into a beautiful church and present the light of the life of God through Jesus Christ to each other so that we would be filled with the light that, covers, that conquers the darkness and to our neighbors who are suffering in darkness and in loneliness, depression, and anxiety. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.